We're up to five, so maybe I will start and wait for the next one. I can I can ramble on with for quite a while before I actually say anything important. Um, any questions from anybody while while we're waiting here? From your shooting or otherwise? Okay, so let me uh, go to share the screen here. And uh, everyone see that uh, the title screen? Wow. Somebody said, wow. You okay? Yep. Someone go, wow. Let's see, you. here we are. Super. Okay, today we're gonna talk about composition. Um, and I kind of, I love this topic. Uh, there's, there's a lot to talk about when we deal with composition. Good composition, the, the way you arrange the image, uh, both in terms of the elements in the image and, and how those elements come together can have a big impact on the quality of what you're taking. Um, it allows you to have the eye feel comfortable as it explores the image. There are some images that, that just hit you and your eye doesn't know where to look. Um, everyone can see my pointer, right? Yes. Yep. Okay. You never know where to look. Um, picture like this, you've got, got an obvious uh, point of interest that to kind of pulls the whole image together. Good composition will draw your eye to fo and focus of attention onto this area here. Uh, and there'll be limited distractions composition will help get rid of the distractions that may pull your eye away. Uh, but there's a lot more to that as well. We'll be talking about a number of things today. The first is talking about believing your eyes. And I'm going to talk a lot about various guidelines towards good composition. Uh, but the first thing I would say is that you shouldn't necessarily believe all this stuff. All the guidelines that we talk about came from what looked good to people at some point. Um, and you're a person and you have your own eyes. So if it looks good to you, that's, that's really 90% of the story. The guidelines can help you get that way, but you should never feel like a picture that you find very good is necessarily bad just because it doesn't follow some artificial guidelines. We'll talk about, a lot about telling a simple story as the first step in taking pictures. Um, we'll talk about cropping, uh, how, how foregrounds can be added to an image to, to really draw the eye and make people feel that they're on the ground. In terms of drawing the eye, the idea here is to have an image which tends to draw your eye across it to the, to the area of greatest interest, the focus of your, of your image. And we'll talk about comp compositional guidelines that do that. Uh, we'll talk about how sometimes an odd number of, uh, of pieces in the image can actually seem better. We'll talk about you giving head and nose room for whether it's animals or people or even, even flowers. And we'll talk about the importance of spacing, avoiding overlap when you have a number of uh, components in the image. And we'll talk about eliminating distractions which can pull your eye away from the, the subject of the image. And finally, we'll talk about the idea of not just taking pictures of pretty things. Um, there's a tendency sometimes to, to drive up, see a pretty thing, take a shot of the pretty thing and drive away. Whereas you, you can do a lot once you've taken that sort of first postcard picture, start working, working the site and finding different angles that can add a fresh outlook. The whole idea is to make images, not just snapshots. So believing your eyes, um, what this is all about is to say that there's no right way to take a picture. This was a, this is a Japanese maple tree in my lawn and this particular season, it just blew up with color um, at a time when all the other foliage was off the trees. It was really a fascinating display. And I decided to try to look at it to see how many different ways I could shoot it. Um, there was the obvious just taking a picture of the whole tree here. Um, but also there's an advantage to moving in, uh, looking at a smaller area where you see the detail in the leaves and also having 
sort of a nice matrix to have the leaves uh, suspended from here, this nice, nice diagonal lines. Um, I tried taking a picture with different lighting here with transillumination, the light shining through the leaves, and that can be a, quite a strong image. And I started playing with adjustments in the lens. This is a zooming of the lens from far out, zooming it in close and holding it there. And you get this kind of radial pattern, uh, which I had shown you before. Um, you can also use lens or uh, camera motion in other ways. This is a picture of the leaves on the ground with the camera panning to one side and you get this interesting streaking pattern. You can also take a picture of the, tr of the uh, tree using a different sensor, a sensor that sees a different spectrum of light. And the classic example is here with an infrared camera. I took one of my old cameras of the Canon 20D and I had it modified to take infrared. Um, infrared really makes foliage light up. It makes it almost look like a winter scene. This is taken at the same time as the original picture and gives you an entirely different look. What's infrared? Hmm? What's infrared photography? I don't understand. Infrared is part of the spectrum that we don't see. Yeah. It's beyond the normal red range, uh, but you can have your camera pick it up. Okay. So we don't see it, but uh, th this is the pattern when, when the infrared comes in. How do you do that? Well, uh, you could put filters on the camera, but they have to be okay. heavy. Turns out that the sensors on, on uh, digital cameras tend to be uh, highly sensitive to infrared and they, okay. they have to put a filter in front of the sensor to block it out. Okay. Um, so I sent off my old uh, Canon 20D to a company that makes these kind of adjustments. They take the camera, they take out the infrared filter and they adjust it so you can get these kind of pictures. Okay. Uh -huh. It's really kind of fun to take it out. It's particularly good during, during the summer when there's a lot of foliage on the trees. Mm -hmm. This is my favorite picture of the uh, Japanese maple and it's kind of simple. Uh, I was panning down and kind of drawing the light from the sky into the, into the tops of some of the leaves. And I just kind of like this, this view. But there's a lot of different pictures that I took. And the question when you look at this is which is the correct view? Um, and the answer is there's no one correct view or composition. They all have their value and you can decide what works best for you. Um, and part of what this shows is that with a camera, you can display something in nature in all sorts of different ways. Um, it's it's uh, your choice in many ways and nothing is particularly wrong. Uh, this is Pablo Picasso was self-portrait done in 1907. Uh, and he had an interesting quote about this whole process of making art. Um, he said, all, we all know that art is not truth. It is a lie that makes us realize truth. And I love that statement. Art is a lie that makes us realize truth. When you take a picture, the very first thing you do is that you put a frame around a portion of the outside world. You don't take a picture that includes everything 360 degrees, although sometimes you can do that. But most of the time you're gonna put a rectangular box around a portion of the real world and that's gonna be what you show and you decide how you display this, this kind of false image of what the real world is like. So we're automatically making judgments about how we're gonna display the world. And it's a lie that makes, hopefully makes us realize the truth. And he finished up by saying, the artist must know the manner why, whereby to convince others of the truthfulness of his lies. I love that, the truthfulness of his lies. So we start looking at composition as different ways to tell a story about the surrounding environment. We should never think that we're telling the whole story uh, and not worry about having to think about doing that. So you want to believe your eyes when you look at it. Just this, this is just an interesting picture for me. It's, it's a sugar maple tree in Guilford, Vermont that was the uh, state champion uh, sugar maple until it got hit by lightning. Actually got hit a couple of times and they finally had to take out a major section in the middle. I love the way that the arms come up almost in supplication and a nice shadow coming down. 
Um, doesn't necessarily follow all the rules of composition, but I think it, it's a strong image, with a, particularly with the lighting. In terms of the rules of composition, you have to remember that every rule of composition is derived from what looks good to some human eyes. People didn't, the human race didn't start with innate understanding of what works in terms of composition, balance, symmetry of images. Uh, they learned some rules which were based on what they thought looked good. Um, and you have to remember that your eyes are as good as everybody else's. You don't need to be a slave of the rules of others. Um, and if an image follows the rules and doesn't look good to you, it's a failure. So after all this uh, business of telling you not to worry about the rules, the rest of this talk is going to be about the rules. Here are my rules and we'll just call them guidelines. Thing, sort of a starting point for good composition. Uh, and learning the, the kind of rules that others have come up with is a nice starting point because then you can start from there and then you can figure out how you want to break the rules. And there's no problem with that. First rule I have for you is to tell a simple story. Um, this is a picture of uh, the uh, the pumpkins gathered on the quad, on Fisk Quad at Keene State College, uh, right before the 2014 Pumpkin Festival. Um, and the students are supposed to be going to be picking up the pumpkins so they can carve them for the festival. Um, and when you look at an image, it's good to kind of describe the story in your mind. Um, and this one we describe as, you know, a bunch of pumpkins sitting here, beautiful fall foliage above and a beautiful blue sky with lots of students on the quad and Fisk Hall in the background. A lot of stuff going on in this image. Uh, and you should ask yourself whether this is described with a sentence or a paragraph. And I think this is obviously a paragraph image. A uh, lot going on. These sort of images are not bad uh, to begin with, to sort of establish where you are, uh, but they don't have the greatest impact in, in terms of symmetry and beauty. Um, oftentimes it's better to have an image that's simple that you can describe in a simple sentence. At the same time I took this picture, I turned around, laid down on the ground and got this picture. Um, much simpler than the first one. It's just a line of pumpkins with some beautiful leaves in front. You can describe this with a sentence. And I think that although it doesn't tell as big a, a biggest story as the first picture, I think it tells its story uh, with more impact and uh, beauty. So that's what you want to think about. Here's an example. I was trying to take a picture of these nice leaves floating in the water and there was a stream coming through here that was shooting through a slot, but there was too much going on in this image for me to catch it all. Um, in this situation, in order to tell a simpler story, I tried to fill the frame and that's something to think about when you're taking pictures. If you have a subject, it's not a bad idea to fill the frame with it rather than to have extraneous stuff around. And that's always something to look for. So instead of this picture, I had this picture of just the leaves sitting uh, in that pool of water. And I think it was more effective. This is a good picture of uh, one of the uh, pumpkin festivals. And uh, it's, you know, it tells a good story. It's got nice uh, uh, depth of field. You can tell everything's in focus from here off to the back. You can also tell uh, because we have the starburst effect on the lights. And remember we said that a small aperture can lead to that starburst effect that we call, that we talked about. Um, and it's a good picture. You know, that I actually sold it a couple of times um, and it tells a story. I don't think it as effective and I don't like it as much as this picture which I think uh, is a simpler story showing the beauty of the pumpkins and the light coming from them. Uh, so again, filling the frame with something interesting, keeping the story simple uh, can be, it can work wonders. I love this little pumpkin back here that has a little pumpkin on top of it. Uh, the, the, uh, I, I'm, I miss going around and seeing all these, all this art. Here's another example, and this is very simple. This is a, just a bunch of like, lichen sitting on the ground by Spofford Lake, um, but it's kind of busy with all the rocks, uh, and I moved in for a simpler picture, um, and I think this is more effective simplifying it. Later, I'll talk about how having an odd number of components in a picture tends to be stronger, and this is an example of that with three. 
here's my daughter Abigail holding our, our nephew, little nephew Isaac, uh, a couple of years ago. Nice picture. But again, moving in on the important, the important subject, I think has more impact. Of course, now I have a grandson. So of course, this is what I focus on most of the time. Uh, this is little Owen. This is uh, last Halloween. So I've got an even cuter. It's talking now, so. Now, sometimes you can have a picture which is covers a rather large area. And I, I tend to, to lean towards landscapes that are kind of large and inclusive. Um, and I love this picture. This is a broad brook in Guilford, Vermont. Uh, and I love the light coming through the foliage. And particularly, I like the effect of the, uh, of the color of the yellow uh, coloring the, the brook as it comes through. So I think this is an effective picture. But the key elements in this picture that make it interesting to me is the reflection of the yellow. And so a picture like this that zooms in on that is important. Not that you should, I shouldn't take the first one, but I think this is even more impactful with this beautiful yellow color. color. And then more importantly, these two rocks, which uh, provide a contrast with the, uh, with the yellow with the soft yellow color. So you want to try to fill the frame at least as part of your approach to any scene, trying to simplify. Now I'm going to go from there to talking about getting foregrounds in your images. And this is something that uh, that I think is very important. Um, this is a picture of a, a sugar shack in Swansea. Uh, this is a nice postcard picture of the sugar shack. Um, but once I take the, the initial picture of something like this, my next step is to try to look for foregrounds to put in it. I, I look around for various, various parts of the image, foregrounds, maybe something that frames the, the main subject of the image. Uh, in this case, there was a nice foreground to include, this nice stream that came by it, and I only got my feet a little wet. The, uh, one of the, uh, uh, compliments which I most like when people look at my pictures is when they say, you know, it's, it's a great picture. I really felt like I was standing right next to you when you took the picture. And I refer to that as the feet on the ground feeling. And adding foregrounds to your images adds that feet on the ground. It puts people in the scene and makes it stronger. And this, this is also strong because these the, the water just kind of leads you right to the subject here. So I look for foregrounds in a lot of my images. Uh, this is Sleepy Hollow in Pomfret, Vermont. This is a farm that uh, for a while was owned by the Aerosmith guitarist, Joe Perry, not any longer, uh, but it's a beautiful farm uh, in, uh, in Pomfret. And this is a, a nice picture of the major component of it, which is the barn. There's also a house over the side here. Um, but I also pulled back and tried to get foreground in the image. And I think this is even stronger because you've got the leaves on the ground all on this sinuous road, which leads you right to the barn, uh, going along with a fence which follows through. So that adds impact. People who were on our shoot the other day will know what this is. This is the waterfall at, uh, at uh, the Ashwila River Park. I hope everyone got, got shots of that. This was actually taken by one of my students uh, a couple of years ago. And it's a good picture. It's got the nice soft water look of the water. Uh, so the exposure was long enough to get that feel without blowing it out too much. Nice uh, branch at the top here. Um, but it's fairly flat. Um, you don't have that feeling that you're right there. Um, taking a picture like this with foreground really adds, I think, to the impact and gives you that, uh, that uh, personal feeling with the image. I'll show you other examples of this. These are lupins at the uh, at Sugar Hill in New Hampshire during the, their annual lupin festival. This is St. Matthew's Church, which is kind of a classic uh, uh, view that, that many people get. Uh, this is Mount Monadnock look, looking over Perkins Pond, but more importantly, I've got the nice uh, flowers in the foreground, again, giving you a feel that you're there. If you're actually there, you would be joining me with my back pressed up against the railing by the road, um, but it gives you that nice feeling. You could just get a picture of the mountain, uh, but I think this adds a lot of impact. This is Spofford Lake, and in the foreground we have these cat nine tails, 
Um, the nice thing about this picture is that the, this is taken in the morning when there was still fog on the lake so that you saw the tree here, but you didn't see all the stuff on the other side of the lake, so it added impact. Sometimes the foreground, foreground is your actual subject. You know, and here, uh, the, these flowers are in focus and the, and the background is really a, a secondary point component, but it still adds the sense of being in place. Sometimes the foreground will absolutely demand that you take a picture of it. Uh, <laughs> This is a sea lion on, uh, at uh, um, on Santiago Island in uh, James Bay. Um, and the, the animals on the Galapagos just don't pay any attention to humans. You can walk right up to them. You can step over them if they're sleeping. And this guy was just looking, saying hi. Uh, behind is our ship, which is the uh, National Geographic Ship Endeavor. Uh, this was an amazing trip uh, all around. So with that, I can kind of summarize my approach to scenes when I'm, when I'm shooting. Um, and this is when I drive up in the car and I, I see a place that I want to take a picture of, how do I approach shooting it? Um, and the first thing I do uh, of the three steps is to take a broad postcard view, kind of like the one that we saw before here. You know, you get the broad view of the whole scene. Um, the next step is to find things of interest. Uh, it may be an area where you have trees framing the view. Um, it may be where you can find a good foreground. And I think that adds a lot of uh, foreground such as we saw here. Uh, here's another example of foreground that also adds framing to the picture. The, the center of interest is this hay wagon in the distance here. This is in Walpole. Uh, but the trees here both are uh, at foreground interest and a sense of framing. And finally, I move in for detail. And this is something I always have to remind myself. Uh, I still kind of lean towards the big pan sort of panoramic views. Uh, but you can often get very interesting things if you move in, get closer and closer. If you feel like you're close to something, you know, step a few more feet closer as well and look for all the detail as I did in this picture here. So that's, it's a good three-step approach as you look at a scene. And what you're doing is you're really working the scene to get everything out of it before you move on. Now, another way to uh, simplify an image is through cropping. And cropping an image can be done in the camera as you're looking through the lens, or it can be done afterwards uh, when you edit the picture. This is a picture of a boat coming in early in the morning to Cerro Dragon uh, Island in the Galapagos. Uh, our ship had a, people separated themselves out in terms as pho photographers. This was actually a photography cruise. So there's a ton of various photographers on board. And uh, we had photographers and what we called natural history people. The photographers got up early and went in when the light was still nice first thing in the morning. And then they came back, had breakfast with all the other people, and then we went in again. Uh, this is a boat approaching Cerro Dragon. And it's a, a nice shot. The obvious uh, point of interest in the image is the people on, on the uh, Zodiac here. Uh, but there's also nice color in the sky and in the water. All very nice, but a lot of it and sort of redundant. You don't need all of this um, to focus in on this image. So if we do a crop like this, we've still got some nice color in the sky. We can still see the water. We haven't lost very much by cropping. And the nice thing about the new cameras nowadays, they have so many megapixels that you can get away with crops without losing a lot of detail. Uh, but a crop like this, I think, gives you a, a more impactful image and really brings you more strongly to the, the uh, source of interest without losing the surrounding areas. There's another picture I took of a snowstorm looking at the woods. And I thought when I took it, it'd be kind of interesting to have this tree in the foreground. Uh, but as I looked at the picture, it, it seemed to not be tethered to the ground. I didn't think it added a lot. So I ended up cropping like this and I think got a more uh, balanced and uh, interesting image. Now, there's a thing about cropping when you do it in the camera. And people like to get the best possible crop. And so they'll really maybe zoom in or something like that and just get it as tight as they can. 
The problem with that is when you take the picture then into your computer, if you decide that you want to maybe print it in a different size, you may have cropped it so much that now, now the picture can't be uh, sized for any particular use. Uh, so I usually will say, take when I do a crop, I'll usually give myself an extra room around it so that I have the uh, possibility of dealing with it after the fact. And then I can crop the, the image however I want it for whatever use is desired. A uh, good example of that sort of thing is here. This is a, a picture of a barn in, in uh, Westmont and a nice, uh, nice uh, clover in front of it. Um, I left some sky here in the original picture. Uh, I usually save a copy of the picture without any crop before I start doing cropping, depending on how I want to do it. Normal crop might well have been around here, but I had this picture and it was good uh, because that extra space was needed when I sold this to this uh, phone book company. Uh, phone book companies are always looking for nice pictures, but they will often look for a picture that has some sort of space in it where they can put, you know, their writing. And so you don't want to crop right away and you want as, as tight as you can leave some room so that you have the option to use it for other things. Now I want to talk about uh, one of my pet peeves. Um, when you see a picture like this, I've uh, been fortunate enough to judge a few photography contests, and it's amazing how many times you see a picture like this. You know, kind of nice look of the uh, of the uh, uh, early cat and nine tails coming up in the tree in the background. The problem is when you look at this, it, the, the horizon is leaning to the right. I keep on feeling like my body is going that way. The water is going to spill out over here. Um, and I think that having this as your final image is really one of the greatest signs of sloppy work, the tilted horizon. It's not bad necessarily to have a tilted horizon when you have the picture in the camera. But when you bring it into editing, you need to work on getting it corrected. And you never should output a picture that looks like this. There's a number of ways to deal with horizons. And you can, first of all, deal with it in the camera, just while shooting. A lot of camera uh, fields have grids that you can put on it as you look through. And then it, the, uh, the tilting of the horizon is obvious and you can make the adjustment. Uh, my camera actually has a level built in. So I can bring up a little crosshatch here in my viewfinder. It'll show me if the camera is leaning. Here, if, if it leans this way, to leaning to the left, it'll show you this as if it's a level. And it also shows you where the camera is shooting up or down. Uh, but not all cameras have that. But they usually have this kind of grid. Uh, if you end up with a picture that's rotated, that's not a problem. You can rotate it in post. Uh, you can uh, look at your picture and apply a grid as you crop it. Um, uh, you can also have some help with this. Um, in Photoshop, there's the po you have the possibility of drawing a line around along the horizon that you want to be straight. And then you can select a function of rotation called, uh, this is called arbitrary rotation. When you draw this line, and I don't know if you can see it here, there's a little X here and a little X here. So I've drawn the line between. Um, it'll tell you exactly the adjustment that needs to be made to get that to be flat. This is a 2.21 degree counterclockwise rotation. And in this situation, all you have to do is click on it and it adjusts the horizon. But again, you don't want to end up with a picture coming out from, you know, on Facebook or wherever you send it where the horizon is tilted. Now, that's uh, my rule for this. Uh, nowadays, there seems to be a tendency for people who take selfies to always want to have the horizon tilted grotesquely. Uh, this is my son, and this is his former girlfriend, yay, uh, who uh, always took her selfies like this, and it used to drive me nuts. I would complain, and she said, well, that's, you know, just sort of my style. And I guess it's true, because all, of, you know, all her pictures, and these are all pictures she had up on Facebook, had this tilt. I mean, she really tried to do it. Um, and look at the tilt on this one. And I guess what I finally come to is if you take one of these and there's a little tilt, if you do it once, that's a mistake. If you do it 20 times, 
I will have to concede that this mm -hmm. is a statement and I just move on. I don't need to deal with it. But interpretation of what's artistic in an image uh, can be open to all sorts of interpretations. And I guess we can, for that, we can go to the real expert, which is Lucy Van Pelt here. Um, Linus is a, a drawing, a, says drawing a row of trees and I'm going to color them green. That sounds good. But that's not art. I'll put a lake in front of the trees. That still won't make it art. And by the lake, I'll draw a tiny log cabin. That's not enough. You need a waterfall, a sunset, show the sun coming through sort of orangey, put some red streaks in the sky and have some smoke coming out of the chimney. Now put in more trees, make it a forest, have a deer standing by the waterfall. That's right. Now you have trees, a lake, a log cabin, a waterfall, a deer and sunset. I guess we would say that uh, that's a perfect example of having a paragraph describing the image, uh, but, but Lucy thinks differently. That's art. Sometimes it takes a layman to set these people straight. So there's all sorts of interpretation of what's artistic in your photographs. And I wanted to talk about drawing the eye because a lot of what goes into a picture is designed around some subject. And it's good to think about what you're taking a picture of and what's the important element in that picture. Um, in this situation, the important element, St. Vitus Church uh, in Prague, uh, the Czech Republic, this was taken from the Charles Bridge. Um, and the church is, is the center, but there's nothing really that makes your eye move to the church. It's kind of, it's kind of the biggest thing there, um, but it's fairly flat. You'd like to have something in the picture which told you that you needed to look at the church. Uh, in this situation, it was a statue on the Charles Bridge that did that. Uh, but you don't always have this sort of thing uh, with a statue pointing at your subject. And we'll talk about other ways to draw the eye. This is a spiral staircase going up the uh, lighthouse in, uh, in the har outside the harbor of uh, Portsmouth. Um, and the center of attention here, I think, is the top here, the, uh, the, the result of all these stairs. Um, and the question is, how do you draw the eye to it? And there's a number of ways you can do it. One, you can use guidelines. Uh, and th what that means is you place the center of attention in a spot in the image, which uh, typically is considered to be a balanced place where the eye would naturally go anywhere. Anyway, and there's all sorts of guidelines we'll talk about. One that I can talk about is something called the golden spiral, and we'll get there with that. Uh, you kind of think of it because this is a spiraling staircase. The spiral itself doesn't really fit very well because it, it, the, 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 the uh, eye of the, spi the spiral should be right on the center here. But you get an idea that kind of draws the eye. There are other guidelines that you could apply. Um, most of which actually don't work awfully well with this image. There's also leading lines that can draw the eye to the point of interest. Uh, we have the stairwell going up and that's sort of a leading line that brings your eye up to the center of interest. You can have selective focus. Here what you do is, is you keep the area of interest in focus and allow the rest to get soft. Uh, and that can also make your eye wanna go to that spot. Finally, you can use color uh, if you have a situation where the color is brightest at your center of focus. Here's an example of that. I've bleached out the color and everything, everything other than the top. And I think you can see that the eye is kind of drawn to that brighter color. So let's talk about these. And we're talking about first about guidelines. And again, these are lines which tend to suggest where elements in your picture ought to sit uh, to be, be best balanced and to draw the eye. And the one that is used the most by far is called the rule of thirds. How many people have heard about the rule of thirds? Raise your hand. Okay. Um, it's interesting that uh, one of my first shows, I had a person come up to me and say, oh, I like your pictures. I really love the way you use the rule of thirds. And I thanked him very much. And then after the show, I ran home and looked up rule of thirds because I had no idea what he was talking about. Um, and, it and it turns out it's this. 
and it turns out that uh, you know, from my own eye, it seemed I was putting image the uh, parts of the image in, in these locations. What the rule of thirds says is you should take your image and divide it up into three rows and three columns, three equal columns. And if you look at the lines that you've created, that gives you an idea where you might best place the important elements of your image. First of all, there's the intersections of these lines, and this, these tend to be spots where uh, an Im if you, part of your image is placed, it will naturally draw the eye. In this case, I've got the, uh, this cross right over the sugar shack, which is the center of interest in this image. So that's good. Uh, the, the lines themselves can suggest important places where you might also put things of, of interest, specifically the horizon. Um, and oftentimes we want to suggest that you either have the horizon, horizon along this line as we do here or up above. And it depends on whether the foreground is most important, then you'd have perhaps the horizon up here, or if the sky is more important, in which case you have it down here. Now the sky isn't all that magnificently interested in this picture, but I put the horizon here because uh, the road was right down here and I really didn't want any more of the foreground. Uh, the big thing about this to remember when you, when you look at these lines is the one place you do not want to put your horizon is right down the middle. Um, and you also don't want to put things of interest right here. There's a reason why this is called the dead center uh, because it really, becomes less interesting and less powerful. And you don't want the horizon there. You want to have it one place or the other. There's another example of this. This is uh, Blue Rocks, which is a lovely part of the coast of Nova Scotia that has these interesting little inlets for fishing boats. Um, and if we look at the rule of thirds here, uh, the, the blue boat here is nicely stabbed by this uh, point on the rule of thirds. And down here, the, the lobster traps are also reasonably associated with it. Now, it's not right in the center, but that's part of the, the problem with these guidelines is you just can't always force your image to be perfectly matched with any particular guideline. But the guidelines do suggest that areas of interest should be not in the center and displaced a little bit right or left. This may be a little less obvious. This is the uh, at the East Hill Farm. This is the last cow who hadn't come into the barn yet. He's kind of sitting there trying to get the energy to get up and he's looking longingly at the barn door. Um, we apply the rule of thirds. We have the barn here at this intersection and the cow here down here all off center, if you will, although it's the, cow, the cow's butt, if you will. Um, but you can see how the rule of thirds will work here. And it's a good thing to think about as you're looking at your images, both in terms of when you take the image and then after uh, you bring it in and edit it. So there's an, that's just one of the guidelines that you'll see talked about. And I think it's worthwhile understanding some of the others. Although I think if you just think about the rule of thirds, that's probably the best one to consider. Um, this is a picture of uh, my daughter, Abby, and her husband, uh, Grayson. He doesn't like this because looking on top, you can really see how bald he's getting. Um, but this is looking at looking down on them from the Egertown light in Martha's Vineyard. And the question is, how would you want to frame or edit this image for maximum effect? And we can try placing some of the compositional guidelines on here to consider that. The first is, again, the rule of thirds. And rule of thirds, if we put them in this corner here, would suggest that maybe the, the image would be best if it was shortened a bit uh, and give you, to give you more impact rather than extend it all the way up like that. That's rule of thirds. There's a number of other compositional guidelines which we can talk about, and many of them are related to something called the golden ratio. Has anyone here heard of the golden ratio before? Okay, um, it's interesting and it was first discovered in sort of the early Middle Ages. The golden ratio is the ratio of two, two signs and, and the best way to think of this is to think of a line segment. Uh, and you have line A, which is longer than line B. Uh, but this is the relationship between A and B such that A plus B is to A as A is to B. 
and you may think there's lots of situations where that may occur, but there's not. There's only one, one situation where these lines can do that. And that's when the ratio is one to 1.6180 and then on infinitely. It doesn't, it doesn't have a finite number. So that's the ratio. And the fascinating thing is that over centuries, people have thought that this particular ratio can be applied to painting, to architecture, to sculpture, all uh, to allow a, a more uh, balanced and pleasant uh, uh, arrangement of the uh, subjects in the image. Um, you know, it's hard to, hard to know how they came up with that. Part of it is that they, people started looking for this ratio in uh, architecture and sculpture and so forth. Um, first place they looked was the uh, uh, Great Pyramid of Giza. Uh, and they thought that if you measured this sort of distance from the center of the pyramid out to the edge, if we call that one, and we measured the angle up to the top, uh, which by the way is, is usually referred to as phi, this forms a ratio which is base, which is very close to one to 1.680. Now there's no reason to think that the people that built the pyramids knew about this ratio. Again, it hadn't been really noticed yet. Um, but people looked at this and said, oh, this must be some magic ratio that came out to make the pyramid the perfect thing that it is. In fact, you can go out and buy crystal pyramids, which uh, fit the golden ratio, golden ratio quartz pyramids. And uh, if you read the, uh, the stuff about these, it says excellent results are obtained when one applies energy or intention to these pyramids due to their essential ability to amplify and harmonize. I'm not sure what you're amplifying or harmonizing. Uh, but people will actually pay good money to get these things and they'll be convinced that they have an effect. The same ratio was, it can be found in other things though. If you look hard enough, you can find the ratio. Uh, looking at the Parthenon, uh, which was built around, uh, uh, around 447 uh, BC. And if you look at the interior, people uh, noticed that if you just looked at this interior space, and if you thought of this as the as A and this is B, that the ratio approaches uh, this uh, golden ratio for some reason. Um, actually, I did the measurements and the ratio here is actually one to 1 1.6, 1.698 instead of 1.618. So it's close. And so people got excited to think that this must be because of this harmonious golden ratio. You can even look at 35 millimeter film, which is 36 by 24, and that ratio is 1.5, which is not as close, but you might argue that it, it is close enough to suggest that that's also a harmonious relationship. Um, people, people thought that this was uh, had significance and uh, arranged their images and, and structures accordingly. Leonardo da Vinci called this the, the divine proportion. So that's obviously something important. And it can show up for as guidelines uh, for your images. First, there's the golden rectangle. And you can see this is the golden rectangle. And you can see that it's sort of like the rule of thirds, although the middle column is narrower. Uh, it is that way because the ratios are all here. Um, this this is A and this is B in order to make this ratio. Uh, this is A and this is B, this is A and this is B and so forth, creating this rectangle. Um, this would tend to have a, an image which is taller, a bit narrower, and the point of interest would be for closer into the center uh, by, this, by this arrangement. And I, I need to point out that these are often referred to as golden. Uh, I think anytime you have to put the words golden in front of your guideline, it seems like you're kind of gilding the lily a bit, um, protesting a bit too much, but that's the way it comes out. My favorite is that golden spiral that I showed you before on the, uh, on the lighthouse. And this also comes from this relationship. If you look here, uh, this is A and this is B. 
uh, this is A and this is B, this is A and this is B, this is A, so forth. And what you do is you, you draw a curve inside these ever smaller boxes and it curves down to a point. And the argument would be that in your image, this is where you ought to put your, your point of most interest and your eye will naturally be drawn there. If we, people look at, yes? Just Jeff, just when you're actually taking, so you're trying to, what you're trying to say is that it should be offset by 1.6180 or thereabouts. Whenever you're taking the center of attraction of the photograph that you really want should be at 1.6180 from the edge. Is that, am I interpreting it correctly? Um, not, well, sort of, you know, if you look at the rectangle, it's that way. Okay. Um, but it's not just anything next to the edge. It's where it crosses. Um, okay. We go back. Well, I'm trying to go back here. See, in the this makes a rectangle, and this is one point six one eight. Okay. One. Okay. Yeah. Uh, specifically, one point six one eight. Anything from the side. Um, yeah. It's just, if you look at this box, that's set up so that, that, that this is one, if this is one, this is 1.618. Yeah, exactly what I mean, yeah. Okay? Yeah. That's one that's... way to do it, but they, but again, they use it in different ways. They put this spiral, create this spiral out of having increasingly smaller boxes that have that same ratio. And as I said, people looked at it and they said, oh, look, this, this particular spiral has all sorts of analogs in nature. And okay. nature must be following the same golden ratio. And the thing they point to the most is, uh, is the internal structure of a Nautilus. Uh, to me, the, the, uh, the uh, spiral is tighter than you see in the uh, golden spiral. But people always point to this. And they all often point to other things in nature. They look around and they can find situations where there's a spiral. You can see it here. For some reason, this thing is sticking in a spiral. Now you can look at other parts of nature, and they don't have the spiral. But people look at it and say, "Oh, you know, this is this is a a natural occurring phenomenon, which must mean that this ratio has some sort of magical significance." So the spiral applied to the image would put uh, Abby and Grayson right here, and also make the image taller. Uh, you have the golden diagonal in the same way. And with the golden diagonal, you have a diagonal line across the image and then a, a line coming from the other corner, which intersects so that you have the same sort of one to 1. Uh, 1.618 ratio. And you look for where these intersections are. And again, you can put the intersection right on them. And again, it looks like a bigger image. So the thing is, you look at this, when I look at all these different guidelines, is that it's hard to find a spot in this picture that you, that to put your point of interest that isn't intersected by one of these guidelines. And so I think there's a lot of a retrospective looking at the image and then trying the different guidelines until you find one that works. Uh, and whether it necessarily works as, you, as you're trying to make your image may be another question. But there may be some benefit from using these sorts of things. I think oftentimes you just look for this and you'll find it. Here's a picture of a, of a sheep in a field in Dummerston, Vermont. And you can see this works pretty well for the golden rectangle. Um, the, the face of the leading sheep is right here at the intersection. And the horizon here, the first horizon, as you, as you look at the edge of this pasture before it falls off, falls nicely right there. So this works for the golden rectangle. I didn't think of it as, a, as the rectangle when I took the picture, uh, but it turns out that what I ended up with really worked with it. One of my favorite examples of this is this one. This is an eagle uh, in, on the Mendenhall Glacier in uh, Juneau, Alaska. And I love the, when I took it, I just love the fact he was looking out and I, and I love, I like the idea of including these parts of the, uh, of the spruce tree here. Um, but if you look at it, you can apply the golden spiral very nicely because it runs along the uh, branches and comes around and intersects with the bird. 
So again, I didn't think of this at the time, but you can apply it. Um, people apply all these to all sorts of things. Uh, and they, they thought that uh, Leonardo was particularly am, uh, enamored of these ratios. And I looked at an article which actually looked at the hormonal Lisa because she gets, she gets bludgeoned with all these sorts of things. And he applied the golden spiral to her saying, oh, look, Leonardo used the golden spiral on, on this particular famous image. Uh, and the spiral comes right down to her nose. Um, the problem with this, of course, is that he didn't include the whole picture uh, in his application. You can look at a picture at any source uh, and kind of nail it. The, this spiral would suggest that the point of interest ought to be off the side of the picture, but her, but her face is right dead center and really wouldn't, and really wouldn't apply. If you had the spiral in the whole thing, you would end up suggesting there ought to be something over here. If you take the way he applied the spiral and you crop the picture that way, you can see it doesn't look much of anything like the original. So people do a lot of, of kind of pushing these guidelines perhaps further than they should. Uh, Poor Mona Lisa has been pushed in all sorts of ways through the years. Uh, you have the duck lip Mona Lisa selfie. Uh, and more recently, there is the pandemic Mona Lisa, uh, which, is getting her, which is getting her shot. So she's always been used this way. Um, so we have these guidelines. And the question is, are they worth thinking about when you take your pictures or when you edit them? Uh, they've become sufficiently popular, though, that they show up in various places. Specifically, they show up in both Photoshop and Lightroom in Adobe. Um, if you go to, to crop an image in Photoshop, you will have the option of applying a grid to the image as you crop it. And you have various grids you can use. And you can see it starts with a rule of thirds. That's by far the most popular. You get a plain grid and a diagonal, but you also have the golden, tri golden triangle um, uh, the golden ratio and even the golden spiral. So these are popular enough so that they show up by, and you can apply them to your images if you want to try to make them fit a particular guideline. So what do we do with guidelines? It's obviously a guideline soup here and you can pick whichever one you want. I think there's some uh, consistent recommendations that come out of all of them. You'll notice that most of them can be made to sort of intersect here, putting our subject uh, away from the middle and down here to the right a bit. Um, if you look at it, you can almost say that there's an area in the middle here where you probably shouldn't have your uh, subjects of interest. And I, I refer to this as sort of the cross of death. Um, I think they all kind of form that way. One of the problems with applying guidelines to images is that the guidelines don't know what the picture is and what kind of message you're trying to present. This is a moonrise over Mount Monadnock. Um, and the question is, did I apply a guideline with this picture? We can apply a number of different guidelines, all centering on the obvious uh, area of the moon. Uh, but none of them really fit what I actually did because there's a lot more space here. When I took this picture, I wanted to make sure I had the moon, I had the nice cloud formation above, which caught the light. And I wanted to get enough of the, mat, the peak of Monadnock uh, to make it look like it isn't just cut off here. And so I ended up with a picture that was longer, it didn't fit any of the real guidelines, uh, but worked for me because of the subject. And again, the guidelines don't know what your subject is and you have to pick and choose among them. So what can we say about guidelines? Um, and I show this picture here because it doesn't really fit most of the guidelines, but it's one that I really like, the contrast of the, of the soft uh, ferns and the hard bark of the trees. Uh, first thing I think a good rule is to avoid placing point of interest right in the dead center of your image. Again, we talk about dead center. You wanna avoid placing the horizon in the center basic rule. And it generally appear, uh, has the, a situation where uh, there's more dynamic interest if you place your area of interest, your focus of interest, 
in roughly those areas where the lines of the rule of thirds intersect. And that's close to where some of these other guidelines intersect as well. The point to remember is that these guides can help focus your attention on the importance of balance in the image, but they, you should never use them to alter what seems right to your own eye. Um, and also right for the message of the photograph. So the guidelines don't know what message you're trying to transmit. But they can be helpful. And I think if you just take the rule of thirds from all this stuff that I'm throwing at you, I think you're doing well. Well, another part of uh, leading the eye to the focus of your image is to use leading lines, particularly when they're diagonals. Um, the focus of this image is obviously here, the keeper house at Marshall Point Light. And I'm sitting, standing here with my back to the lighthouse, shooting along the rails of the catwalk, which goes out to the lighthouse. And it forms a strong lines pointing right at the center of interest. Here's another example with uh, fencing. Fencing seems to come up a lot when we talk about leading lines. And the fence draws you into this area, the background, the tree here in particular, but also the barn itself. Here's another example of uh, a leading line bringing you to the subject. Uh, this tree is right in the center of the image. And we might normally say, well, this, this should be, be stronger if it was off to the side some. Um, but the, the power of the line coming diagonally across here, drawing your eye to the tree, I think overpowers everything else. Also, the tree has more, uh, more branches in this direction. So it doesn't really feel like it's dead center. You can have more than one leading line. Uh, here we have uh, the shadow of this tree with just a, a array of lines all drawing your eye to the tree itself. That uh, is very strong. You don't, leading lines don't have to be lines. You can have just elements in your image. Uh, this is sunrise at uh, Brenton Woods and these rocks kind of line up to my eye, uh, which draw your eye to the top here. At least, and I, and I should say, when I talk about what these things do, it, it's always a matter of what it does for me. And you can argue that you don't see this as something that, that has this effect. Uh, and please pipe up if you do, and I'll just uh, delete you from the discussion. Uh, but uh, I, at least I see that. Now, where are the leading lines here? Uh, this is the, a church in West Guilford, Vermont. Um, I guess you can say that this post tends to lead your eye up to the focus here. But you also have this strong fence line here, not really pointing towards the church. Um, now, this one you may argue with me about. Uh, but to me, I still feel like my eye is drawn up there. And it's drawn by the fact that this fence line comes to here. And then this fence line picks up and brings you right to the church. And so... I see it as sort of a double leading line that brings me up there. So in some, some of these diagonals and leading lines can be kind of complex. Now this is sort of the polar opposite of a leading line you know, or a diagonal line. Fences going really just along on their own on the side of this hill in Putney, Vermont. Uh, it has a, a, a horizon which is probably in a reasonable place with the rule of thirds, not in the center. It has a point of interest at the top here, which is sort of at the intersection of the rule of thirds. Uh, but these fences don't really pull your eye in that direction. Probably enough to pull it there without them. But I want you to notice in this situation uh, that these fence lines going parallel don't add a lot of energy to the image. They're kind of a, a, kind of a soft, restful appearance rather than a strongly pulling your eye or adding drama to it. Now compare these fence lines to this fence line. And this shows the power of, di of diagonal lines to add energy to an image. Um, it's hard not to follow this to this point here, which is our center of interest, this gap in the trees. And you have parallel lines all tending to draw you in that direction. So this is a very strong uh, uh, leading line and made stronger and adding more energy to the image by virtue of the, di the strong diagonal. So to my eye, this is, uh, has a lot more energy in it than this. 
You can look for diagonals in images to add energy to them, even if they're not pointing towards something. Uh, this is the marquee at the Colonial Theater in Keene. Uh, this is a nice picture of it. Um, but I, I moved a little closer and looked up at it. And I went from this image to this. And I think, I hope you can see that this is a more dramatic, has more energy to it uh, than, than this one. Mm. you all agree with that? Uh, yeah, but how did you get the one third image this thing, rule of thirds over here? Is it because you want to focus on the colonial bit towards the one third? No, I don't think this necessarily deals with the rule of thirds here. Um, and again, I, I don't think you'd apply rule of thirds to this image uh, because there's there's no particular single focus you, you want to draw your eye to. It's the whole thing. Um, and... Uh, that's where the image is. So every image doesn't have to fall within the rule of thirds. Okay? Yep. All right. Here's another example of how diagonals work. And this picture almost got me arrested. Um, I was in Hannaford's in, in Keene, and I was taking pictures of the produce uh, to illustrate this very point. Uh, and a manager came up to me when I was taking these pictures and told me that I was not allowed to take pictures of the fruit without a written uh, uh, permission from the headquarters of Hannaford's. Uh, fortunately, I had already gotten what I wanted. Uh, I, I think that you see people all the time with their cell phones taking pictures of stuff, you know, labels and things like that. But somehow the big cameras that I had tend to seem to intimidate them. But the point of this picture was to show this of the fruit and then compare it to just a simple diagonal. And I think this is the better shot with more energy to it. You can see that in flowers here at uh, Walker Farm in Dummerston. Compare this image to that image. Yeah, it's more powerful. Diagonal. Uh, there's no rule of thirds here. Everything, everything yeah. is about the same. Uh, but, but there is a big change in terms of the energy of the picture by having strong diagonals in it. It's, uh, it's ironic to me that these pictures, these diagonals do look better, but your son's ex-girlfriend's selfie diagonal, you know, that was so bad, but this is, it's just ironic. <laughs> yeah, well, of course hers, it was the horizon being the diagonal that, that was, was throwing you off. You know, and that, that's, that's, that's her style. And that says a lot about her, actually. <laughs> I, like, I like Jeremy's new girlfriend. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, so, some, so I think it does make a more powerful image. Sometimes you can have a diagonal that really isn't involved with a line. It's, it's a matter of where you place the points in your image. And I showed you that before with those rocks. Um, I was taking pictures of this bullfrog on Harvey Pond. And the frog was coming closer and closer to me and also to this wonderful water lily. And I kept on taking pictures because I didn't know when he was going to just shoot off or go under. And he actually came all the way up to sit next to it. Uh, and I often refer to this as the prom photo. Um, or you can say in this picture, it, it kind of looks like he's saying, I want to date the lily. And that's this, this line here without a diagonal. But as he approached, he kind of formed a diagonal to the lily. And I think that had a little bit more energy and looked a little more sinister, probably because his eye was staring right at it. And this one to me says, I want to eat the lily. Um, but he didn't do either. He just admired it when he was gone. Um, so diagonals can add a lot to, the, to an image, whether or not they uh, point you to a particular point in the image, which is a which is your focus of interest. Uh, this is a fence uh, uh, in uh, the Grand Tetons looking at the sunset. We had, we had the smoke from the fires in Iowa and, this, and the one thing it did do was give us nice sunsets. Now, these rules don't always apply well when you look at the image. And sometimes you have to break the rules. Uh, this is a picture again of Marshall Point Light at sunset, nice color in the sky. Crescent moon up above. I, you know, made sure that I got the, the light from the lighthouse in, in the frame. You have to sit there and you kind of time it. And you realize, you see how long, 
how long after it goes out that it then comes on again so you can get your image at that point. Um, but it has a problem here. Look at the horizon line. It's right in the middle. I told you you shouldn't do that. But, but there was an issue. Also, also, the focus of interest, which is the lighthouse, is also sort of right in the middle. But with this, we have the problem of them. I had to get up and get the moon in the frame as well. Uh, and I wanted to get the full course of the catwalk. Uh, and I had no way to get all of that in there uh, without having the horizon dead center. I could have cropped the uh, picture so that I had less of the catwalk do something like this and get the horizon off the dead center. But I didn't like this. I didn't think this was as powerful as this image. So this is a situation where breaking the rules of the rule of thirds, I think makes sense in terms of what I was trying to get within the image. And you shouldn't worry about necessarily always following the rules. Another way to draw attention to your subject is by using selective focus. Uh, this is a, you know, a, a dried out corn husk. It was actually, this, this stalk was sitting at the edge of the field, so it didn't get clipped when they took all the others down. Um, so it was a nice contrast and very interesting. I got a nice focus on it. Um, I had a fairly small aperture, so I got the, the corn as well as the stalks in the background in good focus. And in this situation, these tend to distract from the corn itself. If you took, I then took the picture with a, with a larger aperture to have a narrower depth of field and focused on the corn. But now that the stalks in the back are even just fairly slightly out of focus. And I think it allows your eye to settle on this particular point of interest by using the selective focus. I share a lot of examples of that sort of thing. This is Lupin's death uh, at Sugar Hill uh, at their Lupin Festival with the horse nicely in the background. Um, I wanted to get the, the Lupins in focus. They had to pop and it was okay to have the horse in soft focus in the back. This is my uh, lovely dog. Sophie, who is just frolicking in a field, and you could concentrate more on her with the, with the hill in the background out of focus. And it's another thing that you see a lot when you start doing macro photography. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in this background with leaves and other flowers and so forth. But if you have a, a shallow depth of field, you can get the flower nice and sharp, but have the background soft. We talked about this as the bouquet. Um, and it's a nice way to make the flower pop against the background. Oh yes, and I have to show a picture of Owen again. Um, and portraits, uh, yeah, again, uh, show the, the subject better if the background is soft. So I did talk about drawing the eye with color. And here's a, I showed that this was the first slide of this talk. And you see the barn, it just pops out of the image because it has that contrasting color with everything else. Here's another example, again, of a red barn popping out. This uh, uh, is cheating a bit because your eye goes to this barn, not only because of the color, but you also have the leading line of the fence. Also, the, the barn is sort of in the intersection of rule of thirds. I just noticed today, it's interesting, there's this circle of branches which almost nails the rule of thirds. So I don't know if that was planned that way. But this has got a lot of things that draw your eye, uh, color being one here. Uh, it does point out that you can have multiple guidelines to draw your eye to the same place. And this is an example of that sort of thing. Um, I think of the, uh, the point of interest is the area down the road. I always love uh, concentrating on the distant part of the road. And can you see what sort of things point us in that direction for the eye? Any suggestions? The road itself? Yeah, the road follows there. And it also has these lines along the road, sort of leading lines that come right into there. Okay, that's one. Anything else? Yeah, the leaves up on top, the, people, the yellow leaves up on top, yeah. You now, everybody always mentions that. I think, if anything, those leaves are sort of a distraction. When you look at the picture, you, you, know, you, you often go to the brightest part of the picture. And so these kind of distract a bit from, from the point. 
the diagonal, the, the green, evergreen branches are kind of drooping down towards that. Okay, I don't, don't really see that that well. But let me say the things that I see here um, are, first of all, we have color. And, and I showed you the bright color of the barns, but also a contrasting color that's lighter or more muted can draw the eye. And we can see that this area where the road goes, uh, it gets a little bit more foggy. So it's, it's muted colors. And I think that can draw your eye. The other thing is that this was right on the rule of thirds. Cut the image up, that's right there. So we've got all these things going on here. We've got the leading lines along the road. We have the difference of color at the end. And we also have this in the middle of the rule of thirds. So all those things pull the eye down the road. It's not, it's not a great picture, but it, uh, it does have a lot of the elements that uh, tend to work to get you to... Get Just one to sec, you said that. you wanted the center of attraction to be the end of the road. Why then did you not put a sharper focus over there and a soft picture of the leaves? Why didn't I soften these leaves, you mean? Yes, okay. and sharper at the end. If that is what he really wanted. Yeah, um, I, I could have done that. I could have focused here and had a shallower depth of field so that these foreground trees would be soft. I didn't really, they didn't really think that that would, would uh, be the best way to do it. Because I think you want to see the detail in the trees through here. Um, so I didn't do that. You don't have to apply every rule uh, to every picture. It'd be interesting to think and see how that would look. I ought to, I ought to try that. Um, but uh, I think I think one of the problems with the image getting your eye down here are these bright leaves up on top because they did tend to pull the eye. Um, I might have cropped these out a little bit more, or I could have gone in and just and just had faded the color and brightness of them again. Uh, but I think it worked pretty well without it. But that's good. Po all good points. Here's an interesting thing. It turns out that when you have a few elements in a picture, uh, it generally is good to have an odd number of them in the picture. Generally, one and three are better than two and four. I have trouble finding examples of this because I generally tend to put three uh, or five in, uh, things in an image. But if you look at this example of these lilies, um, there's two and then there's the three. And there would be an argument that these three seem to be a more powerful image than just having the two. Do people see that? No. No. Okay. You don't have to. You can check out on this one. <laughs> uh, but in lots of situations, and you can try it, you can see that, uh, that three pieces in the image tend to be stronger and also five. When you get up to 25, you know, 25 is not necessarily better than 24, obviously, but in small numbers, it tends to work. Here's an example of two iris and one iris. So it's something to think about. I'm not, I'm not strong, I don't feel strongly about it, but I think it's something that is suggested as, as uh, something in the image that can make it stronger. What are those things called that are there apart from the blue? Inside the edges, the edges inside the inward edges, whatever you call them. Yeah, yeah. these ones where you're pointing at. What do you call these? They're beautiful. I know it, they're, they're, it's gorgeous, and I don't know that they have a name, they're just part of the color of the leaves. It's um, just so spectacular in yeah. a single. The thing I like, I think this is this image is far more powerful than having two or three. You know, like this is beautiful by itself, single. I agree, that's what we're trying to show. Of course, the advantage is that that iris is just you know, kind of perfectly in focus and, and yep. uh, works very well. Yeah, I like that picture. Here's a picture of a uh, tufted titmouse um, standing on a piece of bark here. Um, it's a nice picture, nice and sharp. Um, the problem as I see this picture is that the tit titmouse is looking to the left here and his gaze is cut off by the edge of the image. If we give him room to look, the mm -hmm. image becomes stronger. And the argument here is that you always, if you have a, a, a person or a bird or an animal looking in one direction, <clears throat> you want to give them headroom in that direction. 
uh, so they're not cut off. We call this sort of thing negative space and it really adds to the power of the image. You have this girl here looking at the tray of desserts uh, at a wedding um, and you preferably frame it so that she's looking this way, so you give her room on this way, on this side to see it. This is Jessie showing off her tattoo at the same wedding, but again, she is looking this way, so we want to give her room this way to look. It's also true with movement. Uh, you saw these horses before; um, they're moving towards their dinner. Uh, they're running in this in the, this direction to the left, so you want to give them the room to run in and not cut them off. And here's a grizzly bear uh, along a stream in Alaska, and again, moving in this direction, you give him room, you give him his nose room. And funny, I also have a picture of my grand my grandson looking off in this direction, so you give him room to look. So when an animal or person is looking or moving in a certain direction, you want to think about giving more space on that side uh, so you don't cut them off. It can be also true of plants. To my view, this plant is looking towards the left because the, because the stamen is heading off that way. So as when I frame the picture, I give more room on this side rather than cut it off. Now, Cutting off a person when they're looking or moving can add a certain amount of drama to the picture. Um, here we have a picture by Wynn McMee of, of, uh, of Dick Cheney, otherwise known as the Dark Lord. Um, and he pur purposely chose to frame him right up against the side here. So we're cutting off his line of gaze instead of having him over here and having room for him to look. And that adds a certain amount of tension uh, that you may decide you want to use in some pictures. Um, it can also show up in other people uh, with the same sort of effect. And I didn't frame these, these were framed uh, by the original photographer. Just a quick question over here. Can I ask you a question? What kind of lens do you use for close up of flowers that have come so beautifully well over there, which highlight the details? What sort of lenses is it that you use? Well, I mean, it's just a matter of having a lens that will focus when you get that close. I have a, I have a macro lens, which what is a, mac a macro, what mac which is a hundred millimeters, and allows you to focus so that you can get the image to what's called one to one. That that's usually what the definition of a macro lens. That means that the size of the image on your sensor is the same size as what you're shooting, and you can get very, you can have close focus in that situation and get a sharp image. So it's a macro that you use, 100 mm macro is what you suggest. I like, I, I love my 100 millimeter macro. It's a fixed lens, um, but okay. you don't have to have it that way. You can have a, a shorter lens that's a macro as well. You could have a 50 millimeter macro. Okay. I, like, I like the longer lens because it allows me to get back a little bit from my subject. So if I'm taking a picture of a bug or a butterfly or something, I, I don't have to be as close to get it full in the, in the uh, on the sensor. So can you fit a 100 a macro on a 50 mm lens? Can you do that? No, you don't, you don't put it on the lens, you put it on the camera. You take the 50 okay. millimeter off and put the 100 millimeter on. Okay, all right, thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. All right, that's headroom. Another thing to talk about is to think about spacing in your pictures when you have multiple elements. Uh, this is a pic picture of the Grand Canal in Venice from the Rialto Bridge, and it's a classic view, particularly at sunset. I had to work my way to get to the edge of the bridge through the crowds, and then I just set up, and I took lots of pictures while the light was great. Um, and one thing I was hoping for is I could avoid the overlap of the boats in the canal. And you can see here, uh, we've got a number of interesting boats, uh, but they're overlapping in lots of different places. Uh, I finally got a picture where they were separated and that makes it much stronger. It's the picture that I print out. You can see the same sort of thing with animals. Cattle tend to, tend to all gather together and you can have a situation like this where they're all clumped together. Uh, this is just a matter of waiting until by natural and generally you'll find a, t a time when they're all separated enough so that you can get a picture where they're defined. 
they don't always separate like this. And I had to wait long enough so that they all ignored me. When you first set up, at least one cow is, is assigned the job of looking at the photographer. Uh, but if you wait long enough, then they'll start going back to what they normally do. Now, sometimes you really can't avoid the overlap. I, when I have a misty day like this, I always like to have one animal up close that's seen with, with less muting of the colors because he's closer. But I, they had this cow behind here, which was just up this guy's butt all the time. And I kept on waiting and he just stayed right there and there was no getting rid of it. So I had the picture and they had to do something. So I cropped it here, cropped it tight. And then I had to clone this part of the animal out. And when I clone, uh, you take little pieces of the area around and you copy them onto, the, onto where the animal is to get rid of it. So I went from this picture to this. How did you do that? It's magic. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, there's a tool in Photoshop where you can click on some other place and then go over to where you want to remove something and okay. paint on that and it will paint what it be from the area where you clicked and you can get it so it, it can obscure the uh, the initial source and yet not not be able to see that you had taken it from someplace. And it's what called, software is that? Hmm? What is the name of the software that he used for that? It's Photoshop. Photoshop. It's Photoshop. Photoshop. And it's, a, it's something called cloning. So you're okay. cloning one area to another. Thank you. Now you can also, it doesn't have to be animals, you can also have uh, trees that can overlap. This is a, a nice picture of a, of a glade at uh, Rhodes End Farm and the light in the morning kind of comes through nicely and illuminates the trees in the back. But my problem was I had these clumping of trees together uh, that didn't allow the light through. But oftentimes, and in this situation, I moved just a little bit to the right. And when I did that, I opened up these areas and I got the image to look like this. Avoiding that overlapping as we talked about. Okay. It's just a matter of finding the right angle where you can see everything together. And this is often a challenge when you're looking into a forest like this. Well, one of the things that's a particular problem with composition is distractions. Things that draw your eye away from your subject and pollute it. I took this picture specifically to show the, uh, the most important distraction photographer, for photographer, and that's wires. Uh, you don't realize how wired our environment is until you start trying to take pictures, uh, particularly in villages and cities. And there's almost no, no way to avoid all the wires here. This might be a reasonable photograph. All this junk wasn't in the way, uh, but it's hard to avoid. There are ways to avoid these distractions, starting with talking about wires. Um, this is a, uh, one of the mill buildings at, in Harrisville, uh, New Hampshire. And it had these wires coming across this bell tower, um, obviously uh, uh, distracting from the main image. Um, I was able to get rid of them by simply walking closer to the building. So I got to the point that I was sort of under the wires. And then I got this picture, a little bit different orientation, but no wires because they were back behind me. So a good way to try to get rid of wires is just editing with your feet, trying to find a location where they don't seem to intrude. The one thing you'll notice with this is we still have the shadow of the wires here and that, that may be considered a distraction of its own, but uh, you could remove this with cloning as well. Now, sometimes you really just can't edit with your feet. Uh, this is another scene from uh, uh, from uh, Harrisville, looking a classic view, looking at the uh, library across the mill pond, and uh, lots of people get pictures of this particular scene, and lots of people just sit and enjoy it. Um, the problem is that there are all these wires that come across. Now, I would argue that most people, when they look at this scene, when they're standing there and certainly when they remember it, they don't remember or actually see the wires. We are so used to having wires in our life that we kind of block them out automatically. Um, and the question is, is it reasonable for a photographer to try to get rid of these wires? Um, 
if you make a painting, there's no question about it. This is a painting by Ann Ward of the same scene. And you'll notice that she didn't paint in the wires and no one really would expect her to do that, even though you couldn't really say that this is a natural scene without the wires in it. When you look at this kind of scene, uh, there's really two questions. One is whether the uh, scene is worth editing out all the wires. And then the second one is how much you're gonna to have to work to get rid of all the wires in the scene. Uh, and it may be that the, that the scene just isn't impactful enough for you to think it's worth the time and effort to get rid of the wires. Now, this, you can see the wires here. As you look at it more closely, you can see that the, it's really a dense mesh. This is looking at one section and you can see all these wires that are coming in. And the way you deal with this, again, is cloning. There are actually some newer tools that kind of do this automatically. But what you need to do is, for example, you'd have your little cloning brush, little circle that you could click here, and then you bring it up here and mark off and cover up the wire. You'd get here where you'd have to cover it up with the green. There are places here where there's a branch going through the wire, so you'd need to pick up an area of branch down here maybe, and then clone it above. And you got to work your way down each of these wires doing that. Uh, this sort of mesh, it, you know, it can take in a couple hours to do it. Uh, you eventually get a situation where you've cloned out the wires like this. A lot of work, but I think this, with this particular scene, it's so dramatic that it's worth the work. And when you get finished doing that, you take a scene that looks like this and change it to that. Wow. Wow. Um, and I think it's, it's much nicer because the wires show up in a picture much more than they do when you're just standing there. They just kind of leap out. Yeah. As, I, as I did the, the, the dealing with the wires, there were places where it was particularly difficult to go back here. And that's where it tends to cross the architecture. Because for example, to get rid of this wire right here, you have to take a piece, have to clone a piece over here and then paint it and align it perfectly so you can clean it up. Now, this picture isn't quite finished. Can anyone see why there's still a little more work to do on this? The wires in the water, the reflections? Absolutely, good pickup. I didn't get the reflections yet. And the things you have to do when you deal with wires is deal with reflections. You also have to get the shadows. These wires cause shadows when they cross buildings and other places and you need to clone out those as well. So there's a lot of work, but I think it's, it's worthwhile. Sometimes it's a lot easier to clone out a distraction. This is a, I like the, uh, the, the trail that the tractor made going up the, this field up to the tree at the top. A nice difference in, in uh, textures between the grass and the shadow and in the light. There was this little post sticking out and you have to ask, well, is it worth removing it? I think once you see it, uh, the eye just tends to be drawn to it rather to, than to the other symmetry of the picture. Um, so I think it does have impact. The other thing is this is really easy to get rid of with cloning. Um, so you do that and it's gone. It's cleared up. And I think the picture generally looks better that way. I showed you this picture of Abigail holding uh, the, our nephew. Um, Nice picture, I love her smile. She has a great smile. Um, but there's one place here where there is a distraction which bothered me. Can people see where it is? Jan, you, your, your, your audio is on, so I can't hear you if you're talking. There, that strap on her shirt. This here? Yeah. Yeah, that's just part of her clothing. No, I don't think that's a problem. All right. Anything else? Um, uh, the piece of hair over here. Well, you can't see my mouse. Um, <laughs> here or here? Yeah, those piece, straggling pieces of hair. I don't know. I guess I think it's kind of natural there. One of the important things as you look at a picture and as you, as you in the camera and as you look at it later, uh, is to always 
try to avoid just looking at the main subject. Your eye always goes to the main subject and you may miss something in the periphery. So it's always good to scan the periphery of the image. And the thing that bothers me is this thing right down in the bottom, that little triangle of light. You see it? That may seem kind of minor, but to me, once I notice it, it's kind of hard to avoid it. The eye keeps on going back to it. So sometimes these sort of distractions can be quite minor. Again, it's always important to scan around the uh, picture to look for these sort of things. Um, and I want to get rid of this. I could clone this out easily, but it was easy to take it out by just cropping the picture a little differently, like that. And I think that's cleaner. Now this picture uh, I really love because I love the reflection of the fall foliage in the window. Uh, but there's a couple of little distractions here which bother me that I thought were worth taking care of. Who sees it? Sees some. What do you think? I've scared everybody. There's a thing on the siding to the left of the shutter that's a little weird. This? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, that's a little thing, but it bothers me. So I, I took care of it. It's gone. There's one other thing that I that I wanted to take care of. Yeah, the whites in the window, the window panes, you know, the louvers just on the right and the left hand side, the whites over there. No, just above, yeah. No, just right above here. that. No, above that. Just to the left. Now just move to the left. Yeah. Yeah, these white things. I mean, the, uh, the, the white the spots on yeah. the louvers. Yeah. Just that, that's the natural way they look. I don't know that I would go through and wipe them out because then, because what that does is it gives definition to the louvers. Okay. The one thing that I don't like is this little twig down here. Okay. Uh, it's, it's minor, but you know, you get rid of it. Uh, and I think the picture generally looks cleaner and, and it doesn't have the distractions that you'd have otherwise. All right. Another distraction which you run into a lot is damn people. People get into your scenes uh, and it's hard. I showed you this picture of uh, Peggy's Point Lighthouse in Nova Scotia before. Um, it's, it's remarkable to me that people will go to see a sunset and they'll say, oh, let's go to the lighthouse. And then they stand next to the lighthouse. Um, and when they stand next to the lighthouse, they don't see the lighthouse. They're looking at the sunset. They could be standing over here um, and have the same kind of view. Um, but for some reason, people like to hang around the lighthouse and it drives the photographers mad. And there was a couple of other photographers with me down here trying to get a picture of a sunset with a lighthouse in it and all these people were in the way. If you zoom in closer, you can see them all here. Um, and the question is, what do you do about that? Um, in a normal situation where you're just taking a picture, sometimes you wait until the person leaves or maybe goes to the other side of the lighthouse. I couldn't do this in this situation because I wanted to catch the sun coming down just as it hit the top of the rock so that I could get these rays of light spreading out. So I didn't have the, uh, the uh, luxury of being able to just sit, sit out and wait for these people to disperse or put themselves in better places. So I needed to do uh, what we did before, which is cloning. Uh, taking a little piece of the sky here and going over these people. These people who are on the edge here are easy to clone. Go back here. You just kind of move your little brush over them and they can be wiped out. You can do pretty much with these people as well. And again, people who are up against the lighthouse are a little more difficult because I have to take a small brush pick up a little bit of this edge of the door here and bring it down here to block off this woman and, his, and her child. There was also a person down here that I had to deal with along the rocks. The other thing I did when I, when I started removing all this stuff was also removing some of the flare uh, that comes out uh, as you take a picture looking right into the sun. Anyway, doing all of that, I was able to go from this to this. And I got to tell you, there's a certain amount of joy in the ability to wipe out people so easily uh, and not get arrested for it. Uh, it, it just kind of, you know, some of us in the back were talking about whether we ought to have BB guns to shoot at these people that are in the way. Uh, because if they all went, we'd be a little easier. 
but you can get the, uh, the effective picture by just dealing with that. There's another way of dealing with people distractions. Uh, this is a Washington Monument during cherry blossom season, and people love to walk by this area and take pictures of the cherry blossoms. I was trying to get a picture of the tree and the uh, monument in the same frame, but there were always people here in the image, whether they were looking up at the cherry blossoms or playing in the yard here, uh, there were always people. But the people that were in it were not always in the same place. So I was able to take a number of pictures and then stack them all together and pick out the, the pictures that had the images clear in each area. For example, this guy is standing right in front of the trunk of this tree here, but the trunk shows better on this image. So I was able to bring out the trunk here instead of here. And, uh, but then where there are children here and here, I was able to use the grass from here to get them out. And eventually I was able to do all of that with a little cloning and then get a picture without any of the people, even though there was, I had no individual picture that, had, uh, that didn't have people in it. So you can do that sort of thing with distractions. The copy and paste? Um, what you do is you, uh, in, in, the, in the program, you can put the pictures all together and line them up one on top of the other. And then in each of the pictures, you can, uh, you can elect to uh, wipe out a certain area. Uh, and if there's, a, if there's a clear area below it, if there's that person in front of the trunk is in the, is in the front layer, you can just erase that portion of that picture and the, the, the area underneath will come through. Okay. And sometimes you can take three, four, five pictures to have it so that so, there's always a, a, the possibility of finding a place. A just a quick question. I have never experimented with Photoshop. Do you have to buy that software? Is it already there in my computer? Uh, no, you have to buy Photoshop. The best way to do it, I think, is to do what's called the photographer's uh, plan. Um, and that's a plan where you can get the latest versions of both Lightroom and Photoshop uh, for 10 bucks a month. Okay. Um, which is, which is, you know, people complain about subscription uh, programs. A lot of companies are going to a subscription format rather than selling you the software outright. Um, I think it works well because you're always getting the latest version. Anytime there's a change, they, they send you an update. Um, and $120 a year um, is what I might spend to buy, probably less than I would spend to buy the, the most recent update of the program. So what do you call it? Photographers? Yeah, if you, if you go to Adobe. Yeah. Adobe.com and, and just, you know, search for the photographer's plan, I think, or deal. Um, okay. And you can find that. Okay. Are they sold together? Um, or can you do one or the other? Uh, I think that Lightroom is still available as a, uh, a standalone that you can buy. Uh, Photoshop isn't. Uh, you might find an older version. Um, increasingly, as you go along and they keep on updating the versions, the standalone, the old standalone, that one that you have, will become increasingly out of date. It still works well, but you're going to be. They keep on adding features that make it more powerful. Right. Now it's tough to just jump into Photoshop. It's a very capable program and it's so capable capable that it's very complicated for people to get started get their hands around how to use Im how to use image layers and masking and all sorts of other adjustments uh, that's why I would I often suggest that people try using Lightroom first uh, use what sorry Lightroom that's Lightroom the, that's the other program that comes with uh, with this photographer plan okay. Lightroom is Light a Lightroom Light room. Okay, one word. One word. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, you know, I, I can't really teach you Photoshop or Lightroom at this point. Uh, you know, it would take more than this course does. I, I do have a, I do teach a course on Lightroom. Um, I'll probably get started with that again at some point. Okay, I want to show you one other way to kind of get rid of the wire distractions. Uh, this is a picture of the uh, 
old firehouse in Spofford and I, and I went out when there was a good snowstorm and I wanted to get it in the snow. The trouble was there were these wires, okay? Um, and cloning this out would be very labor intensive. Again, I, it's all coming across the building. So I have to try to pick off little parts of the building to clone over these wires as they come across. Not such a problem up here, but where it crosses is difficult. But I found that if I stepped forward again, here's editing with the feet, I couldn't get rid of the wires, but I could get them to the point that they were no longer going over the firehouse. Okay. So I, I took them away from, the, from the, the situation where it would have been very arduous to clone, put them up against the sky, which is very easy to clone them out at that point. Um, so that's one way you can edit with your feet again, the wires are moved. The trouble is when you approach a building like this and you get close to it and you look up at it, you notice that the walls tend to, to lean in and to look like they lean in. You may see this if you're in a big city and you're looking up, taking a picture of a building, the buildings all look like they're leaning in towards you. Uh, this is called key stoning, key stoning. Um, and it's a common effect. Uh, the good thing is that in Lightroom or Photoshop, correct this and pull the walls out so that they're plumb and so you can go to here. So here's the picture. I've gotten rid of the wires. I've corrected this distortion and I've got a nice image. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing a lot of stuff here and you may, is, does anyone think this is cheating? No. Good. Improvising. The answer is you're correct. Um, you know, you, you do what you could do and, and what you're doing is get taking the most of your, what, you, what your uh, capabilities are to get the best image. Um, we can go back to Ansel Adams again, famous photographer, famous for these kind of pictures with uh, black and white with beautiful skies and nice contrast between bright and dark, even though you can see detail in both, uh, does an amazing job. This is a picture called the Winter Sunrise Sierra Nevada and it's one of his famous ones. Uh, it is included in a book which is called The Making of 40 Photographs, which I would recommend to you. Uh, he takes 40 of his most renowned photographs and talks about how he captured them in detail. Uh, a lot of good stuff about how he got to the spot, where he timed it. There's also stuff about how he mixed his chemicals for development and things like that, and that you can go over, go over quickly because he wasn't, he wasn't using digital, this was all uh, film. Uh, but this picture has one problem with it. And when he took it, um, he, found, he found out that the, the kids at Lone Pine High School had put an LP on the side of the mountain, which you can see here. And he went in and uh, did an arduous job of basically removing this from the negative. And I've done this a few times and it's, it's very delicate work. You have the negative and you have a, a ink with a very fine brush or just a dot and you're kind of just putting dots on the image to try to remove the blemish here. And he was able to do that quite well and get the, this impressive photograph. Now, when people found out that he had done this, uh, they were all enraged. They said this was cheating. It was not a natural picture of the scene. Uh, he should be ashamed and so forth. Uh, his response, I think, uh, sums it up well. He said, I'm not enough of a purist to perpetuate the scar right, right here and thereby destroy for me at least the extraordinary beauty and perfection of the scene. So if Ansel says it's okay to do these sorts of things, I think we're okay to do it. Finally, I wanted to talk about the importance of not just taking pictures of pretty things. Uh, you can be in all sorts of places where you have a beautiful vista, like here on Lake Louise in uh, Banff National Park in Alberta. Uh, great scene. Um, there's a, but lots of people have a tendency just to take a picture of the scene. They have the picture of the pretty thing and they're done. Um, when you have a scene like this, you want to work it and try for different angles, get different perspectives, uh, different foregrounds, all sorts of different things, and make the image more than just the picture of the pretty thing. And it's a matter of taking, making an image and not just a snapshot. And we've talked about a number of things that you can do in this regard. Here cropping in so that we could really focus on the boathouse here in the mountain behind. 
here showing the foreground, which is kind of interesting collections of stones and look, you actually see the stones down into the clear lake here and the nice reflection of the mountain. So a number of different things rather than just taking the pretty thing. This is a picture in Prague of the Charles Bridge. Uh, we showed you the picture of the statue pointing towards uh, the church. Um, and it's a nice picture looking in towards the old town and seeing the bridge. But I, I, and I was on the next bridge uh, down river. Um, but I, I waited until I had something more in the image and I was looking for something more in the, in the foreground. And eventually I was able to get the picture while capturing a boat coming through. So adding something to picture, the picture this, not just the snapshot. This is also in Banff. Uh, it's, a, it's a picture of Mount Rundle looking, looking across the Vermilion Lakes at sunset. That's a nice picture. Um, does have something in the foreground, which is interesting, but it's still a little flat. Um, I don't think it has an awful lot of great perspective. I the went clouds back- clouds are not good. Excuse me? Clouds are not coming out good on top of the mountain. The clouds are looking a bit artificial, if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. You don't like the clouds? Yeah, I don't like the clouds. Somewhat. Yeah, no, not over there. The one on top of the mountain, the That's highest mountain. In that case, you can't have this picture, Adrian. Yeah. But the clouds were really pretty dramatic because it was evening light. They, you know, and so they had this mixture of pinks and blues and so forth. So it, um, they really did stand out. But, you know, you won't buy this. Um, but I went back the next day and I took a picture from the other side of the mountain, actually at sunrise. I went out a lot of times at sunrise to try to get pictures. And this, this, this time was the only time I was able to get Susan to go out with me. And I, I only got her out there by offering a mimosa when she got there. But I got this picture of the same of Mount Rundle. Wow. And here I was able to catch really a, a more impactful image with this interesting wow. little island in the foreground and then being able to look into the water and see the, and see the bowl yeah. underneath as well as, you know, do you like this cloud, AJ? Is this all right? Beautiful. Okay. So I think this, this added a lot to the image, much more depth and interest. Yeah. The quality of the light can be can uh, change and, and make an impact on the image. This is a picture of the uh, Parliament House in Budapest. Um, and I was able to catch it across the Danube with two of these long boats. These are amazing things that fly the Danube coming across. And I, I, have, I was able to avoid having them overlap, which we know we don't want to do. Um, so a reasonable picture. But I came back later at night trying to get a different picture with different light. And I got this. Spectacular, um, you know, with the beautiful light and the amazing light shining on the on the Danube. Um, I think m a much more impactful picture. So, you know, we all we are now all artists, or even just a quick question. Yes. On this this particular slide that you're showing right now, did you on your Canon camera go to B the thing for light nighttime vision light the sea setting? Or not? Um, I didn't have my camera doesn't have a, a, a setting for nighttime. It's B, isn't it? If I'm not mistaken, B. No, B, B me, generally means bulb, um, which uh, allows you to, if you have your shutter, it allows you to take a picture for longer. It allows you to push the shutter and hold it, and you'll get a longer picture. Yeah, there are better ways to do that with a uh, with a cable release so it doesn't shake the camera. I think the main thing here is that this is probably mostly incandescent lighting, and I, I took the picture. I, I think, and I have to remember this. I think I took the picture with a with the uh, uh, with, with the color balance set for daylight, and the result was that the uh, the light was very yellow. Um, I could have made an adjustment probably to make this look very white, but I thought it looked uh, even more impressive with the yes. yellow color. Yes. So you are all artists. Uh, uh -huh. I might even call you smart aleck, uh, smart aleck artists. Uh, people read Bloom, Ca Bloom County. It's actually come back. It's, it's no longer in the papers, but it is on the web. Um, <sighs> So this guy says to Opus, Opus is the penguin, which is in here, which is in there. I says, Opus, what do you mean artists are all smart Alex? What's an Alec anyway? So 
Binkley, Binkley, you see the sky and paint it blue because it is. An artist paints it turtle wax green with flying monkey butts because he's an Alec. <laughs> What's the smart part? Somebody pays him. <laughs> so that, that's all today about composition. And, and, you know, it's just a matter of trying to give you some idea of things to think about as you compose your images and scene and as you maybe adjust them after the fact. Um, and it's good to think about you know, what, what your focus of interest is, how you're going to attract the eye to it, and how you can remove or avoid things that might be distracting. I didn't even mention removing distractions from the ground in front of the camera. You know, you got to get, get the old condoms out of the way and the, and the pack of cigarettes and things like that before you go, or you could clone it later. Now, I've got a few minutes and I have a few pictures from people. We lost one person. Who did we lose? We lost Jill, I guess. We lost a Jill Dumont, which is too bad because I have pictures from her. But I have a few here. We have Jackie's pictures. Um, and Jackie's not here, unfortunately. Um, she sent pictures which actually included a lot of stuff on the top of the picture and the bottom, almost as if she was taking a picture of the screen on her camera with information or uh, the picture came in and had information on it. So the pictures aren't very good resolution. Um, she had the, she caught a nice bee on a flower, but it's obviously quite soft overall. I think it's just a matter of the resolution when, when you take it off the screen like that. Uh, this was sort of interesting. I'm not sure what this says. Kasi, uh, so maybe it's house of something rather. Anyway, that's interesting. It's nicely positioned sort of on the rule of thirds a bit. Um, I might have cropped out this little shadow on the side here, brought the edge in so you didn't have that shadow because that's a bit of a distraction. She also had this picture of somebody uh, dead center. So not awfully good in terms of composition here. Uh, dead center in the image. The only thing it saves a little bit is his leg kind of forms a, a mini leading line right to his head. Um, but you know, you'd want to put him maybe with the edge over here um, and like that so that he wasn't right in dead center. Jill had a nice picture of a bee on a flower and she sent me both the initial picture that she got and then how she edited it. Uh, she obviously brightened it up and cropped it. And you know, if you can see this, there's a bee here on these azaleas. Um, and this is after she had adjusted it. She caught the bee nice in midair. Um, she cropped off the side here, so it wasn't really dead center. Um, I might have cropped a little bit in the top here so that it would uh, not be in the middle of the line here. But overall, it's good. Nice focus here. Um, there's noise in the picture, particularly in the shadows. Um, and that, I think, is largely an effect of the fact that she didn't expose it well initially. And so she had to really push it to get it to be, to brighten it up. And when you do that, you can bring out the noise as well. So the only thing would be to try to get your exposure correct in the camera so you don't have to push the image as much to brighten it. And Jan, we got some of yours. What camera do you use? That was a Sony A6000. Yeah, good, good pictures. I think you, did you send me the raw images? Yes. I think you did. Um, they were big. Um, when you send them again, maybe, maybe take them in and change them to a, you know, you know cut, them, cut the size down and change it to a JPEG so they come across well. There's no problem doing that with the interpretation of the images. This, okay. this is nice. Where was this taken? Um, across the road from my house. Oh, beautiful. This is your view from your house? Yeah, that's in Walpole on County Road. That's lovely. I've never been up. Where's County Road? It's, it goes from Prospect Hill, which is near the center of town, towards Keene, and it ends up being Court Street. Okay. Okay. Is that, you call that County Road? Yeah, it, it's the old Walpole Road on the Keene end, and then it yeah. becomes County okay. Road. That, I always think of it as the old Walpole Road. I never thought, thought it was County Road. 
nice view, nice animals here. Um, I don't know that the, the, the horizon is sort of right in the middle. So you might have wanted to decide to maybe, you know, crop a little of the sky. I think, I think the field is a nice, a nice thing to have here. Although these lines are a definite distraction. Um, I'm not sure how you get, get rid of them and still get the horse. You might have cropped a little tighter and then you might be able to clone out the shadows. Those are remarkably heavy shadows though. What's there that, that cast that? Um, I think that's a metal gate or a split rail fence. Really? Wow, they're very, very prominent. That's nice, nicely exposed. As is this, these are our kids that you know? My grandkids. Oh, that's wonderful. Owen is the boy. Uh-huh. Owen's the boy? Yeah. Very that's cool. Great name. And uh, is she a good photographer? They weren't too bad. Boy, they had fun, the both of them. Yeah, that's not... I might have, if I was going to do this, I might have cropped something like this. So you, I'm not sure that all of this stuff up here adds a lot. So I might have uh, brought that down. The camera, the camera has nice resolution, though. It, uh, it's very sharp. And you had a waterfall. Where's this waterfall? That's down behind my house in the woods. Oh, really? Maybe I'll be tromping behind your house. This is nice. It's a, it's a little overexposed. You look at the rock down here and the mm -hmm. rocks up here. I mean, the trouble is you have really contrasty light and that's a problem taking pictures of waterfalls. You have pieces of, of bright light coming through even when most of the waterfall is in shade. Um, you kind of like to have waterfalls in shades and, and, and without little pieces of bright light because they're hard to get. You want to be able to have a long enough exposure to get a soft look. And you've got a soft look here. The water comes down nicely. Do you remember what the shutter speed was? Uh, no, I don't remember offhand. So it was a fairly short, throat, ah, short shutter. I would think maybe, you know, around a second or, or maybe a little longer. You hand holding this? Yes. Okay, so it's really pretty sharp otherwise. So. Uh, you do good at hand holding. I would probably have to have this on a tripod to get this much, this much softness in the water, but it's very good. And you know, the only thing I might crop a little on this side to get this stuff out. That and just uh, just a, a little less exposed. So good. I wanted to ask a question since since you asked her um, what the shutter speed was. Is there a way to know? when you're looking at the image, what your settings were when you took the image? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, most cameras will show you on the screen, in the viewfinder or, or on the LCD, what the settings were. Okay. You may need to adjust what, show, what, what shows up when, at, right after the picture, because you take the picture and then the picture shows up on the back of the camera, right? And right. Including on that screen, you'll see things that tell you what it is. That information is really burned into the image file. So at any point after the fact, you can pull up that information by just looking at the file information. Okay, but once you download it onto a computer, it, it's gone? No, no, it's, it's, it's still there. Oh, okay. Still there. Oh, yeah, you have to have a program that will open up the image and provide you that information either kind of automatically or uh, will provide it if you open up a uh, file oftentimes it'll be like it'll say file or something like that that'll bring up all the details of the of the of the information it'll often tell you what camera you shot what lens you had on what focal length it was set to what the f-stop is what the shutter speed is what the iso it'll tell you what mode you're in whether you're in the, you know aperture control or shutter or manual all those things should be there so okay. the this picture was, um, I took it on the S setting shutter speed and it was one eighth at F22 and ISO was 640. Okay, so reasonably high ISO, uh, but one eighth of a second. One eighth. You do good to hold it still for one eighth of a second. I don't think I could do that. Um, 
we had deep, deep depth of field with the F-22. Um, if I was trying to shoot that at one eight, then uh, I would, uh, I would definitely have to have it on a tripod or at least a bottle pod. So that's uh, that's very good. You have steady hands. You probably didn't have coffee before you did this one. There, there were about ten others that were really awful, though. So yeah, that was the only good one. How were they awful? They were. Um, Why didn't you share them with me? <laughs> Because they were awful. They were more blurry and poorly, you know, shaky. Yeah. Much more um, overexposed. And yeah, if I was going to take a picture like this and try to do a really long exposure, I would often, I'll often set the camera so that it's going to take multiple pictures, doing doing a, doing a burst of pictures, and I'll just hold down the shutter and let it go click 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 click, and hopefully one of them will be steady. And when you first hit the shutter, there's a tendency for the camera to jump a little bit by just the fact that you punched it. Uh, but if you hold it down, it, it can, uh, it, you may control a little better. But I'm, I'm really impressed about your ability to, to hold this. Although if I zoomed in, I might see a little bit of blurring here. But uh, boy, it's hard to say. That's good. Okay. Well, we're done. Yep. Any questions about all that? Forget all the other compositional guidelines, just remember rule of thirds and I think you're fine. Um, although you can impress someone if you, if you say, oh, that's a nice picture. And it's interesting how it conforms to the golden spiral and they'll go running home to try to look that one up. Um, I did, I think um, someone asked this earlier on too, but um, are your presentations available to like for us to rewatch or is that all on your blog? You know, you know, I, uh, I, I'm trying to remember to record these things and I've only remembered to do it once. I have a recording of the first lecture and I don't have the rest. And I, and I, was, I was sure I was gonna remember. Your job from now on is to remind me before I start to press record. Well, this one's recording. It says recording up on my screen. Is it recording? Well, if it's recording, then then I'll put it up. I put the first one up as a uh, YouTube video. Oh, okay. But you don't have the um, exposure one. I don't have the exposure one. Okay. Again, you can if you go back and you look at uh, the uh, blog articles on that. If you've gone and looked at the syllabus that I put together in my blog. No, I haven't yet. Well, if you go there, um, it's organized by lectures, except for the next lecture, which is different. Uh, but it's organized by lectures, and there's a section on exposure, and it includes all the articles I've written about exposure, and it includes okay. all and actually more than what I actually put at the top. So you can get it from there. Okay. Be better than I can say it. All right. And if I find out that I've actually recorded this, then that's great. And I'll, then I will make a YouTube of it and let you have that as well. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Right. Um, Thank happy you. to see you on uh, on Tuesday next week for office hours. We've had a few people show up, not many. So it's a great opportunity to corral me about questions that you have. Whether uh, and don't feel like that there's any inappropriate or stupid question. They're all appropriate. That's Tuesday or Monday. Tuesday, Monday. You're right. Monday. I probably show up on Tuesday. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's Monday at six o'clock. Monday is six o'clock. Six o'clock. Okay. Uh, I'd love to have more people come, but you know, if, you, if you're fine, you don't have to feel like you need to come. And then we'll see you next week. And next week is a uh, kind of a collection of a number of things. And there are things that I had previously tried to squeeze into other talks to keep it at four, four lectures. And I finally decided <laughs> It was enough to really put it in its own separate lecture. And we talk about things like uh, uh, steadiness of the camera, uh, autofocus. We talk about uh, uh, color balance and adjusting that. And I also have a section on flash. And I never, never talked about flash in this talk before. 
and I've added a section on that to kind of talk about the basics of uh, using flash photography. So that's finally in there. I started, I put that in there because with a grandchild, I'm suddenly using a lot of flash. So I figured it was a good time to include it. So that'll, that'll be next week. And if there aren't any other questions, we can bail from this. I'll unshare my screen. And I guess we are recording. So that's good. So we will see you next week. We'll see ya. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.